Anyway, um, if you have your Bible, would you please open that to 1 Peter chapter 5? 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to start a little series this morning, three-part series uh, entitled Safe. And can you step in the room back there and get my umbrella? I left it laying on the table. Um, with everything that's going on in the world today, it's easy to get rattled. Everything that's going on your, in your life right now, it's easy to get rattled. Um, you know, I preached a series early in the year about spiritual warfare and, um, and, and, and coming, you know, taking the spookiness out of it. And, you know, because it, 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 that can be a real weird and flaky thing. And I didn't realize then how much of a, a really just a prophetic word that was because what ended up happening after that, it seemed like everybody really needed what I had to say uh, and what the Lord was trying to tell us. And with everything that's going on in your life right now or even in the world or in the economy or on the news, it's really easy to get fear, uh, get in fear, get rattled by it, to get lured to sleep almost. Maybe say, uh, you know, maybe you go the other direction and go, well, you know what, that happened somewhere else. That happened, you know, in France, or that happened in Belgium, or even when it happened here, it happened across town, you know. Uh, it's real easy to have so many things going on that you, you go from one extreme to the other. Um, both of these frames of mind where you're, you're either worried that it's going to happen to you, or you're so like, oh, that's just so far, you know, that, that's somewhere else. Um, both of these are wrong. And both of these are just as dangerous as the other. Um, you know, just this week we had earthquakes in Italy, uh, earthquakes in Burma. Um, you know, there's always attacks of terror going on somewhere in the world. This time of year... Here in Florida, we know this is hurricane season. And has anybody seen uh, uh, Gaston out there? Somebody sent me a, a picture uh, of it churning out there in the Atlantic, and it said, no one storms like Gaston, no one rains like Gaston. And I just laughed. I thought that was hilarious. And um, <laughs> so this is the year that Florida, this is the time of year that Florida goes through hurricane season. And, and people are, you know, what do you do and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, um, and, and th these are things that, you know, you can go, well, it's not going to happen to us. It's never going to come here. Um, you know, and, and faith people are the best at it. They go, oh, I got my faith up, and I'm believing. I'm t speaking to that storm and telling it to stay out there in the, in the ocean or go somewhere else. And, and that's right, and I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm believing for it as well. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes when you see all the violence that's going on on TV right now, you know, all the things about the police, uh, you know, with, with all the racial tension that's going on in this country. Uh, and I want to say this, um, I, you know, uh, racial uh, tension is just another trick of the devil. Now, should we be aware of things going on uh, and should we be sensitive to, to other people's race? Absolutely. And if you're not, that's something you need to work on. But the tension and the, the, the anger that's rising up, when it causes uh, one race to go against the other, they're exactly the same as the, as the person that was the, is, was the bigot anyway. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying that. It's not my notes. But I just want to say, you, you turn on the TV right now, and you can see it. It's everywhere. And you can think, well, that's going to happen somewhere else. Or that happens over there. Or that... That kind of stuff's wrong. It's happening everywhere. The attacks that come on people's bodies attack the bodies of your loved ones. You know, as soon as it seems like as soon as your kids go back to school, it seems like they start talking about lice <laughs> and the flu and and colds and bugs and and stomach virus. This anybody else know what I'm talking about? Um. With the uncertainty of the economy, the future of your retirement, the future of your stocks, your investments, it's easy to get worried about it. 
It's, worry, it's easy to worry about when your spouse goes to work. It's easy to worry about who's going to win the election. It's easy to worry about where you're going to put your money. It's also easy to sit back and say it's going to happen somewhere else. The bad things are going to come knocking no matter where you live or no matter where your faith is. Faith is not something that, that will shove away and keep away bad things. Now some of you are sitting there going, I don't know about that. Faith does not keep bad things from coming your way. Faith makes sure that the bad things go away. Now, I want to make sure you understand that. Because I, I had a conversation one time with, with a man, and he had some alarming symptoms going on in his body. I said, you need to go find out what it is. And he goes, why? I said, because you don't know what you're believing for right now. He goes, well, I know I'm believing for healing. And I said, yeah, but healing for what? It may be nothing. You may just have some eating something, and you could not eat that again and never have that symptom again in your life. You don't know what you're believing for. Well, can't, can't my faith just be a big blanket that covers everything? You'd already have that covered, wouldn't you? Is that true or not? I mean, if you already, if your faith was a blanket, how many of you would already, I mean, you'd already, <laughs> just already be believing to be rich. I say it all the time. We'd all be skinny, rich, and happy right now. Our faith does not keep the opportunities away for us to get hurt, to get injured, to lose something, to get a report from the doctor, or whatever. Our faith doesn't stop the reports coming in. Our faith is to change the report. To those who sit around and worry, you yourself get paralyzed with fear so badly that when things do come, it almost feels a relief. Like, I knew this was coming. I knew it was going to happen. See, I told you. <laughs> told me what? That your life is terrible? Who wants to be right about that? Almost everybody in humanity. <laughs> Seriously. When you start talking about bad things happening in your life, it's almost, and, and nobody likes to admit it in front of everybody else, especially in church. But when you know something bad's coming down the pike, and you, 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 you just kind of prepare yourself for it, and when it happens, you go, I knew that was going to happen. Anybody else? Who wants to be right about that? I don't. But we almost stay there, and we, and we, we find ourselves going that direction. So when things do, bad things do come, it's almost like we're relieved that we were right. And when those things happen, we kind of feebly fight back with this half-hearted attempt to overturn it because, well, I knew it was coming. And some people even go, well, the Lord told me it was going to happen. <laughs> Those who never think anything bad's going to come their way are the ones that get so blindsided by it that they never recover. They never get back up because they weren't taking time to get to know God for who he is that is the person that can fix that. They were too busy knowing him some other way and they get blindsided by these things and they don't recover. Both of these are wrong. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 6 says this, and if you got your phone with you today, you can follow along in the U version. All the scriptures are in there. Uh, if you got the Uversion app, you can just click uh, events, and ours should be the first one that pops up. It's GPS located, and you can follow right along. Take notes right there in, in, your, in the app, okay? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 6. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. 
Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Okay, so all you worry words to sit around and worry about things are bad are going to happen. And, uh, oh, this is going to happen. And, oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody else died in my family from, you know, heart disease and high cholesterol. So it's probably going to come my way too. Or those kind of people, you know, uh, you know I, I never have had anything good in my life for a long time. And I'm pretty sure when this, you know, there's a time coming when I'm going to lose all this too. And all the worriers that sit around... Here's where you're wrong, right here. You're supposed to give your worries and cares to God. Why? Because he cares about you. Another translation says he cares for you. What does that mean? You don't need to care about it because he does. Okay? So there's the first wrong. The worriers, wrong. The people that sit back and everything's cool and never going to come my way, that'll happen somewhere else. Verse 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, it doesn't just stop there. Look at what else it says. Stand firm against him. How are you supposed to stand firm against somebody if there's nobody there? <laughs> if it's just going to happen over there and it's going to happen in other countries and it's going to happen in somebody else and it's never going to happen to me, what are you standing firm against? Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. Bad things come to all of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 8, Paul puts a good spin on this kind of, of, of outlook. And he makes it a lot easier to, to, to partake. He says, verse number 8, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. In our lives, we are presented by opportunities to fold up, to give up, to go away, to quit, to stop, to throw in the towel, to file for divorce, to quit our jobs, to walk out of church. This is where a lot of Christians miss it. They don't understand that an opportunity to give up, sometimes we also call those an attack, an opportunity to give up is not a measuring stick of whether you are a good Christian or whether or not you're missing God. A challenge or something being hard, and somebody needs to get this this morning. A challenge or something being hard is not the measuring stick of whether you're a good Christian or not, or whether you're in the will of God or not. Or whether if something is hard or something is facing you or something looks like it's going to try and take you down, that is not the measuring stick of whether or not God is for you or whether or not God's with you or whether or not you're in the will of God or not. In fact, it's probably the best indicator that you are, come on somebody, in the will of God. Why? Because God's not going to try and stop you from doing what he's called you to do. There's only one person that does that. So if it's hard and challenging and things are coming your way and you're getting your feelings hurt all the time and you're getting your, you know, that's not, a, that's not an indicator. Yeah. It's an indicator that there's a resistance. What do we need our faith for? Y'all can see the screen up there, but I, I got one here in real life. Now, I don't believe in bad luck. But I always heard that growing up. Anybody else? Don't put an umbrella up inside. It's bad luck. Oh, my God. What do we have umbrellas for? Is it just so that we can just, hey, hey look how awesome this is. It's kind of it's pointless to have an umbrella for no reason. Umbrellas don't just keep away the rain, though. They have more than that. I mean, now that's what we all know them for, right? Let me tell you some of the other benefits that some uh, that umbrellas have. These also work really good in the sun. Come on, anybody ever go to the beach and get the big ones? 
Any of you other fair-skinned fair people that ignite on fire as soon as you walk outside? <laughs> as soon as you walk out, just like, <laughs> You look like my jacket walking around. <laughs> no. oh These work really good for the sun, too. But not only do they work good for the sun, but anybody ever gone to get their family portraits at Olin Mills or one of those uh, cheesy kind of places, and they turn them lights on? And what's, what's reflecting the light back? It's a great big umbrella. The light pointing at it like this, and it shines the light back at you? Let me show you one more thing. These big ones like this, I love these big ones. These are, they call them golf umbrellas, but you know what the other name for them is? The single man's umbrella. You know why? Come here, Olivia. Come here. Jody's not in here, so hurry, come here. If I'm a single dude and it's raining and I see a girl walking down the street, my life just got better. It's a chick magnet. You can go sit down. If it's raining, if it's raining, what, I'm, what are you saying? We didn't just, <laughs> I was going to give it to you and you walked away. Um, our single youth pastor, Luke, needed one of these. So anyway, um, you're not youth pastor, you children, I mean, you, what are you again? Music pastor, yeah. Music pastor. Um, where was I? The point I'm trying to make is we have things for a reason. Now, the main reason that we have an umbrella is because we want to keep dry when we go outside. But what if there was no such thing as rain? What if Noah's Ark never happened? Would we still need this? I don't know. It has all these other functions, and maybe it would have got invented anyway to do one of those other things. But the main reason it got invented was for that. What do we need safety for if there's not danger? What do we need a shield of faith for if there isn't something to block out? And that's what I want to talk about during this series, is that just because something has the potential to hurt me or get me wet or whatever doesn't mean that there's not a firm answer for what that I need. In this three-week message, we're going to build your faith in the area of safety. Safety for your friends, safety for your family, safety for your kids, safety for your finances, safety for your house, safety for your property, safety for your car. Come on, safety for all areas of your life. And the first point is this. God's will is to keep you safe. Now, some of you are sitting there immediately going, how can you tell me what the will of God is? Well, because I read my Bible. <laughs> and if it's in the Bible, that's what his will is. Many have been conditioned to think that God sends destructive things. Many of people have, uh, you know, have been led to believe that God has taken people's homes. God is, I, I, I mean, I almost cringe when I go to, a, especially a denominational funeral. Oh, the Lord just needed one more angel in heaven. So they, they, they took my, my baby. We're conditioned to think that way. We're conditioned to think, you know, God makes people sick, knocks people's houses down so forth and so on. In fact, it's so ingrained into our, even secular, the secular world calls big destructive things acts of God. Anybody ever heard that? Go look on your insurance forms. I guarantee it's on there. Acts of God. Much of this thinking comes from the Old Testament, mainly from two big stories, and three if you count Job, but we're not going to go into Job because it's it's a long book. 
But I can say this about Job. None of that that happened to Job was God's fault. It all came from the devil, every bit of it. Okay? The other thing that goes on, though, is a lot of times people will pull out the, the ark and, and Noah's ark, and God destroyed the whole world with a flood because they were so wicked, and, and so God wiped them all out. And, and a lot of times people will use that and say, well, he did it once. I mean, how do you know he's not doing it again? How do you know he's not destroying everything in your world just because you, you're wrong and you're wicked and you're doing everything bad? Now, a lot, of, a lot of people start quoting Genesis chapter 6. They'll start talking about verse number 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on this earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I want to I stop right here. This is extra. This is, I'm going to charge you for this, okay? This is free, okay? Right in the middle of this is a great big phrase that jumped off me while I was studying about this. It says, and it, it says, and God was sorry. Now, sorry to me sounds like God made a mistake. That, I mean, doesn't that sound like that? Like, if you ever do something and you're like, I'm so sorry I did that. Like, you regret doing it. Like, now, how many of you know in order to do that, you had to get new information and be enlightened to show that something was wrong? The last time I checked, doesn't God know everything? So how can he have a regret about something that he already knew about? That word sorry there does not mean regretfully sorry. That word sorry is the same when you feel sorry for somebody else, it's an act of compassion. It's an act of, uh, you know, I hate it for you. All right? Um, it's the Greek word that is ra'ah, okay? And it, and it actually means to, to feel sorrow for, okay? So then he goes, if you go on down and you look where it says, because they were so wicked... That word wicked actually means malignant. What does that mean? It would spread and spread and eventually kill the whole human race. Now, at this point in time, now, at this point in time, sin was just now getting loosed on the earth. So, I mean, we, we have a romanticized idea sometimes that as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, that it was just like, Chaos ensued, and everybody just, woohoo, you know, and, and just jumped up on a, on a chandelier and started swinging and, and throwing their coats around their hair and just committing debauchery everywhere. <laughs> That's not what happened. Now, death was unleashed, but people didn't really sin like we think. In fact, I, I think it's over in the New Testament, it talks about that, that really Adam, and until the law of Moses came in and the Ten Commandments and all that stuff, when people sinned, it was because of a matter of their heart. It really wasn't an action until the law was introduced. In fact, I think it's, I don't even remember where it is. It's somewhere in the New Testament, it actually says that, that people sinned, but it wasn't an, a blatant disrespecting what God's command was until the law of Moses came in. And so if you think about it, there were people that were probably alive on the earth that we would consider sinless on their action side. There was probably, you know, it was a matter of the heart then because their heart had to be justified with God. But really their actions, they didn't know if they were doing right or wrong. How many of you know right now that it's, if you went out walking outside your house butt naked... You, if you get caught, you're probably going to jail. <laughs> Rightly so. Amen? <laughs> Start, stop picturing your husband walking around like that, all right? None of us want that. All right, so anyway, why? Why? Because really, walking around naked would be considered a sin. Why? Because it's against the law. Okay? 
It's against the law. Adam and Eve were doing this all the time. What? Why, what are you getting at, Pastor? Their actions weren't the issue. It was the action of their heart. So there were people on the earth that were not blatantly disobeying God, so they weren't really in sin like Adam and Eve were. Now here's the point I'm trying to make, okay? Sin got released and it became malignant in the fact that people started disrespecting God. And once they cross that line, now they can't have grace in his sight anymore. Why do you think Noah found grace in God's sight? Because he still believed in God and still worshiped God and still knew about who God was and still wanted to do everything he could to serve God, even though his great, 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 however many greats back to Adam's grandfather messed it up for everybody. But this word malignant and the wickedness of man shows us something here. It was growing towards all humanity that way, and there was nothing there to keep it in check. Nothing to slow it down, no cure. And if it would have went on, it could have eventually wiped out the entire human race with nobody believing in God anymore. Now think about that. So what is God doing? God is protecting The act of redemption for all of mankind. Because God knew through Noah, Jesus was coming. Wasn't he? So he's got to protect all of humanity. So how does he do it? (laughs) You think, there have got to be better ways than that. Couldn't he have just sent Jesus? Well, he could have, but he didn't. What did he do? Well, he killed them all. (laughs) What kind of loving God do we serve? (laughs) I mean, he killed, he killed all of humanity, wiped them all out with a flood, just destroyed all of it. Let me tell you what happened when all those people died. Now, nowadays, when you die, pretty much two things happen. You either have the Tom and Jerry experience where the escalator shows up and you go up the escalator, <laughs> or the floor opens up and there's a bulldog with a big giant tub of uh, boiling oil and he's going, send them down! Whoa! And that's the funny version, but we know that's true. All right, when, when we die, we're either going up or going down, one of the two. When all those people died in the flood, they went somewhere else. It's called Abraham's bosom. Some call it paradise. Some people call it, you know, <laughs> the Catholics call it purgatory. They don't know where they went. But I know that later on, Jesus actually went there and preached to him. So what did God do? God put all of humanity in a safe place where they can't sin anymore until Jesus could come and redeem them. Now we can sit and go, well, then who are you to tell me that he doesn't do that anymore? Well, after it was all over with and the flood's all over with, he got up and said, I promise I will never destroy the earth again like this. And I'll put a rainbow in the sky to prove it. The Bible tells us that Jesus said, when Jesus came back from the dead, it says he led captivity captive. Another translation to it said, he led into heaven a bunch of people who were dead. What does that mean? Humanity was waiting Now, there had to be some people that sat there and still didn't believe him. Now, you'd think, you're dead, you're somewhere else, and here comes walking a guy and walks in, and just, not like you, you know, he walks in however he wants, (laughs) and has the keys to the door and goes, I'm the one you've been waiting for, anybody want to come with me? And there were some people that went, nah, I think I'm good. Sad, sad. I don't know why I said that. God made a promise that the flood was never going to happen again. Never going to happen again. Okay? So now, flooding and natural, dis- the, the, uh, natural destruction is never going to destroy the earth again like that. There may be pockets of it. There may be little traces of it here and little traces of it. I know what's going on in Louisiana right now is terrible, horrible. I mean, my heart goes out to them. We, we sent an offering. 
We're, we're, we, I mean, we're, we're reaching out as much as we can. I mean, it's an awful thing. There's parts of Indiana that's been hit awful, terrible. But the reason it's never going to be a global flood again is because God said it's not going to happen. And that's why everything that happens like that now, it can't quite do the whole thing. Why? Because it's an imitation and it doesn't have the power. What are you getting at? Those kind of things can't just happen. They can't just happen to those that belong to Christ. You can't just happen to, 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 to things in your... You know, if flooding happened right now, I know churches right now that are flooded. You talk to the pastors, smiling ear to ear, Jesus is Lord, and their victory is still... I mean, they're still in it. Why? Because it doesn't matter about the building. It doesn't matter about any of that stuff. We still have the victory in our Lord. And then they keep going and they keep smiling and they keep preaching. And what is meant to slow them down doesn't slow them down at all. It's an opportunity to give up and go, woe is me, what am I going to do? But they don't. They know what God's promise is. The other thing people talk about a lot is Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, well, God rained down fire from that, destroyed the whole town. I mean, who are you to tell me he's not going to do that now? Well, why did, he do, why did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? A lot of people think, well, it's because homosexuality was just running rampant through the whole thing. There was a whole lot more than that going on there. Now, sure, that was happening there. But it's not like it wasn't going on there before. And it's not like that's the only place it was going on. So if God just destroyed it for that reason, he's unjust because it was going on all over the place. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Let's look here in Genesis chapter 18, verse number 20. The Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I'm going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I've heard. If not, I want to know. Now, this word outcry, you know what that word means? It doesn't mean, oh God, these people are such awful sinners. That's not what that means. That's not an outcry. This word outcry means a call for help. It means somebody in Sodom and Gomorrah was being tortured or held in captivity or you, I like I, I imagine in my own mind probably sex slaving, human trafficking. There was somebody there calling out to God and saying, "I'm being horribly mistreated and ho I am in l grave danger." And it was probably more than one person. It was probably, I mean, if you know all the things that, you know, anything about Sodom and Gomorrah at all, there was a lot of other crazy things going on there. And I honestly believe when I read this and looked it up, that call for distress was coming up to God, from, and the only way to get those people out was to do what he did. And those people received the judgment of God for, the, in my opinion, and you can take this or leave this, this is not hardcore doctrine, I'm just telling you what I believe, okay? I believe Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because that was the only way to get people who were crying out for help out. Okay? So they suffered the judgment of God for the way they were really horribly mistreating someone else. But here's the thing, and here's why it's different now. The judgment of God has already been poured out and satisfied on Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verse number 6 says this, When we are utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time, and died for who? Us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. 
But God showed his great love for, come on now, us by sending Christ to die for us when? While we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sights by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So now, if there's going to be judgment poured out, then what was all this for? Now, that doesn't mean Christians can't be judged. But now it's whether we judge ourselves or we don't judge ourselves. And if you don't judge yourself, listen to me, God's not going to do anything to you until you get to heaven and then you're going to stand and be judged. Here, though, what happens when we're judged now? We're the ones that have to judge ourselves. We either judge ourselves or we don't. If you don't judge yourself, you step out from under the umbrella and protection of God's safety out in the rain. And if you get wet, it's because you didn't judge yourself. John chapter 10, verse number 10, Jesus said this, The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I want to make it clear. I want to make it abundantly clear. God is never behind anything bad happening to you. Ever. Should have got better amen than that. He's not. He is not behind anything bad happening to you. He is, he is always trying to protect you. Why? Well, he promised he's not going to destroy the world anymore. His judgment has already been fulfilled upon Jesus. So what's his will? His will is to keep you safe from that kind of stuff. He's always trying to protect, protect you. This conditioning that the human race falls into comes from false humility and wrong teaching. We all want to say, you know, oh, I'm just so lowly and just a low, and I just deserve whatever I get because I've been so bad. We've all been bad. <laughs> but that's the great thing about Jesus dying for us. I was horrible. You were horrible. But be he wasn't. And when he died, he took your place. And you don't have to have bad things being piled upon you because you deserve it. He fixed it so you don't deserve it. He fixed it so you don't. So this false humility that we all try, oh, I just deserve whatever comes upon me. If you could fix it tomorrow, you would. Don't act like you're so humble you just, you know, eat that just forever. I'll just take that horrible situation and I'll just, I, if you could fix it tomorrow, you'd fix it. You know you would. <laughs> my, my wife uses this phrase with the boys all the time. You know, when they're acting up and acting crazy and they're like, she's like, all right, it's time to eat. What do you want to eat? And they start naming all the things they want to eat. She goes, well, not the way you're acting. You're getting a poop sandwich. Now, we're parents, and we're real, so maybe you, you, maybe you never talk to your kids that way, but we do at our house. You're in a poop sandwich, and they'll go, no, not poop sandwich. <laughs> How do you know? You might like it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. A lot of you have had poop sandwiches served to you. And you try and humbly say, oh, I deserve it. Oh, I just say, you wouldn't eat that poop sandwich for the rest of your life if you had a choice and you could get rid of it. Don't give me the false humility of that. You take the, fa the, fa the wrong doctrinal teaching and God's going to do to you whatever he's going to do to you. And you just got to take it and you just, listen, and then and we still turn around and go pray. God, please change this. Well, if God's putting it on you, what's he going to take it off of you for? It's wrong teaching. God does not act that way anymore. You know why? 
everything that caused him to act that way has been satisfied. The gap has been filled. The gap between me and him, filled. The gap between you and him, filled. You don't have to have something to, 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 to keep you out there in your life. Why? Because he's there holding his hand. All you got to do is walk under it. If it doesn't give you a rich and satisfying life, listen to me, it's not from God. Period. If it doesn't make your life better, if it doesn't make your life prosperous, if it doesn't give you satisfaction, if it's not rich and satisfying, the King James says, I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. If it doesn't give you abundance in your life, then it didn't come from God. Okay? If something is coming against you that doesn't give you those things, you don't have to take it. I'm going to close with a, a, you know, just a fury of scriptures. Are you ready? And then we're done. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. What's the evil one? The one that kills, steals, and destroys. Come on, okay? Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 41, 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 34, 19. The righteous person may have many troubles. And this is where a lot of people pause right there. Yeah, this, I'm just supposed to take it, whatever comes in my life. False humility. But the Lord delivers them from them all. And this is the most famous one I could think of in my, in my studying. Psalms 91, we're going to read the whole thing. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not Come near you. You will, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, this is good. You should shout right here. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for the, he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. When we get started into this, as in, we get started into this. I want you to realize it's it might come raining into your house. It might come raining into your life. It may come storming with F five tornadoes and a hurricane, and it may have an earthquake along with it, and mudslides and all kinds of other stuff. But let me tell you something. There's a great big umbrella, or a great big bubble, or a great big wall, or a great big something to hold it from coming and taking you out, and not being what God's called you to be. You can walk through this world with all of your life safe. And next week, we're going to talk about there is no exceptions. All of it. Everything in your life is safe. Your finances, your job, your kids, all of it. And we're going to talk about that next week. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You can be safe. That's what God wants. Don't blame him. Don't ask him what lesson you're trying to 
He wants you to learn, just don't take it. If it doesn't bring richness and satisfaction into your life, don't accept it. If it could kill you, if it takes away from you, or it could destroy you, you don't have to have it. And you don't have to allow it. And you need to put the umbrella of God's protection up over your life in that area. And if you got some things going on in your life right now that you need safety and protection from, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you down front here. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want to pray for you sitting right there at your seat. If you're going through some hard, challenging times and you need God's protection, you need that umbrella of protection over certain areas of your life, lift your hand up real high at your seat. I want to pray for you. Yeah, don't be ashamed. Nobody looking around. Nobody, yeah. Right there at your seat. Lord, you see these hands. And we pray right now for your safety and protection to be over those areas. Lord, whatever areas those are. Lord God, we know that your desire is to keep them safe in those things. Lord, that your desire is not to see them lose things and not to see them retreat and not to see them go with, it, with less. Lord, your desire is to give them rich and satisfying lives. And now, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you protect them from what's trying to kill them what's trying to steal from them, what's trying to destroy them. I pray that protection right now. Lord, we claim Psalm 91 over them right now in every area, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I also pray for those who have had things stolen from them, things that have been taken from them and it maybe has killed parts of them and destroyed parts of their lives. I pray for supernatural restoration right now in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord God, as they've stepped back under the protective umbrella, but now, Father, they need more than just protection. They need restoration and healing. And Father, I pray restoration right now, renewing miracle working power in their lives, in their finances, in their emotional state, their mental state, their physical state, relationship state. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, restore. Lord, do what your word says, that Lord, when the, 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 the canker worms would steal, Lord God, they would have to pay it back. They would have to give back, Lord God. And Lord, we pray that the sevenfold and would come back. What's been taken from them would be restored plus the seven times. In Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed still, if you're here and you don't know the Lord, you've never had a relationship with Jesus. I, 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 I mean, I don't want to sound mean here, but you don't have the same hope that I was just talking about. Well, you can't tell me God won't do something for me. You're right. God, God can do whatever he wants. And he sometimes does. He sometimes does things just because he's gracious and merciful. But here's the difference between a Christian that knows God and somebody that doesn't know God. I can pray and expect God to answer every time. You don't know Jesus? You just have to hope that he's going to feel gracious today, that he's going to decide to answer your prayer today. But see, a Christian who belongs to him can stand on his word and, and he'll fulfill what his word says. Because we know him, we belong to him, and we have the power to pray in his name. If you don't know Jesus today, you're missing out. You're missing out on the greatest advantage you could ever have as far as safety is concerned. The greatest advantage you could have in this life is a relationship with the person that created you. You're missing out on the greatest benefit. And believe me when I say this, the greatest potential future. So if you don't know him, I wanna say a prayer with you and I wanna give you an opportunity to know him. If you don't know him, would you just say this prayer with me right now from the, from the stage? I'm going to say it. You say it right there at your seat. And invite Jesus into your heart so that he can begin to protect you and keep you safe. 
Say this with me. Father God, I come to you today a sinner. But I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. I believe that he's Lord of all. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer with me, you're now a Christian. You now belong to Jesus, and now he can move in your life as quick as you asking, as quick as you believing. Your life will never be the same.